Rome, Italy, 2013. 16-year-old Angela stared blankly down at the test packet in front of her. Its edges were starting to curl at the top, as she'd been peeling at it with her fingers for nearly 20 minutes. She didn't know the answer to a single question on the first page. Multiple choice wasn't helping either. A text message flashed on the phone in her lap. A client. A very nice client, actually. But no, she couldn't see him tonight. She was out too late last night, and now she was paying the price. Maybe if she just chose one letter, answer every question with A or every question with B. She'd read that somewhere, that you're more likely to get at least a few right if you choose the same letter. Choosing randomly could mean you'll miss every one. Damn, Agnese. Why does she always let Agnese talk her into staying out later and later? Agnese didn't have a test today. She hadn't needed to study last night. A new text message flashed in Angela's lap. Another client. One she would definitely not be seeing tonight, and maybe not any night ever again. She couldn't stand the way he tugged at her earrings while she was sucking his cock. She had been meaning to complain to Mirko about it, just hadn't gotten around to it yet. Another text flashed in her lap, this one from Mirko himself. It read, I hope you feel like working tonight. I have a big fish that I need you to help me catch. Angela smiled and rolled her eyes. She sighed and began filling in the little bubble next to the letter B for every question on the test. Fourteen-year-old Agnese had decided to stay home from school. She had been out late and she was suffering from her monthly bout of abdominal cramps. She lay in bed looking through Instagram, flirtatiously replying to texts from clients, ignoring Angela's complaints about having stayed out too late the night before. Agnese was just getting ready to take some selfies when her mother opened her door and stepped into her bedroom. She had knocked, but it was a knock of show, not a knock of purpose. Mama, if you knock while you're opening the door, then there's no point in knocking at all. Oh, my darling, I'm sorry. No school today? Cramps again? It's a short day today anyway, no point in going, said Agnese. Her mother sat down on the bed next to her. But you are going out to work tonight, aren't you, darling? No, Mama, I don't think so. I don't feel well. I need a break. A break? What do you call this? Staying home from school and lying in bed all day. This is your break. Agnese rolled away from her mother and faced the wall. Her mother put a hand on her shoulder. It didn't feel comforting. It felt manipulative. It felt cold. Look here, darling. I'm short on money and we need funds. Tears welled up in Agnese's eyes. Okay, ma. I'll see what I can do tomorrow after school. Tomorrow? But what about our losses for this week? You must go tonight. What's the matter? You don't want this? I do, Mama. I want to help. But I also need to study and go to school, and I'm tired. Agnese's mother sucked her teeth. Well, I don't know what to tell you, darling. You need to make some decisions. You can't do it all. The bottom line is we need money. And last time I checked, the school doesn't pay you. So it's clear to me what you need to do. Agnese cried silently, staring at the wall. Okay, Mama. I'll see who wants a date tonight with a girl on her period. Oh, please, darling. You're not bleeding from your mouth, are you? Nothing wrong with a night of oral only. And with that, she let out a cackle which she quickly choked down and cleared her throat when she saw Agnese wasn't laughing. She stood up and made for the door. Maybe you'll get lucky, darling. Maybe it will be that handsome lawyer again. Maybe, breathed Agnese. And she squeezed the tears from her eyes.
Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to Dark Dark World. I'm your host, Jordan Crittenden. The writing I did for the top of the episode is essentially fiction. I dramatized some information that I learned from combing through some very roughly translated Italian court documents. Angela and Agnese are real people, and they were teenage prostitutes. But their names were given to them by the courts in Rome to protect their innocence. The case we're looking at here today is the Baby Squilo scandal of 2013. The Italian word squilo roughly translates to prostitute in English. The story began in the posh Perioli district of Rome, when Angela and Agnese decided they simply had to have more of the finer things in life and entered the search term easy money into Google. Angela would later tell prosecutors, quote, I wanted a lot of money, and I didn't want to miss out on having anything. End quote. This simple Google search led the girls to two men, Mirko Ieni, who would effectively become the girls' pimp, and Italian army official Nunzio Pizzicala, who would foster relationships between the girls and high-class clients. High class was the focus of the entire operation. Mirko Ieni purchased a two-bedroom apartment in the Parioli district of Rome so the girls could have a safe, private place to entertain clients and turn tricks. The Parioli district is interesting because it's a very upscale residential neighborhood in Rome, home to many embassies. So you've got diplomats and art collectors and high society types living there. It's also home to private schools, like the ones attended by Angela and Agnese. And yet, Parioli is sort of off the radar in some ways, and is often described by Romans as sort of boring. There isn't much to do there, apart from visiting a few overpriced restaurants and trendy nightclubs. There isn't any public transportation in the area, and while it possesses an attractive aesthetic, it's often described as characterless. It's really just a posh neighborhood for the rich and powerful to live in quietly, making it the ideal place to host an underage prostitution ring. Coming up in Season 1 of Scene of the Crime, Delphi. Why Libby? Why Abby? Why Delphi? Those girls loved each other. They were good friends. Neither one of them left each other's side. Both those girls are heroes. Before the words came out, I knew. I knew this was not good. As soon as I saw that, I knew something really bad happened. The detectives were like, this is not going to take that long. It's a small town. Somebody's going to say something, and this is all going to be over soon. The first couple of weeks, that's what it felt like, is that any day now. And then all of a sudden, a couple of weeks turned into a couple of months. My biggest fear is that whoever did this would do it again. I don't want that to happen to another family, because I'm telling you, it's hell. There was no logical reason anybody would have known those girls or be there that day. Child abduction murders in and of themselves are incredibly rare, but the abduction of two children at one time is even rarer. I've only seen a couple in my entire career. There is a lot of crime scene evidence. Uh, Some of it is somewhat odd. Shortly after solving the Golden State Killer case, I did speak with an investigator that was involved with the Delphi murders. If you haven't walked across the bridge, you don't understand, right? Yeah, like that bridge is scary. It is scary, and those railroad ties are rotted. That bridge scares me, so for somebody to be able to cross it, he's moving well enough that he has to know the bridge. He's done that before. It could have been any one of our kids. It could have been anyone at the bridge that day. It's hard for me to believe that anybody could do something so bizarre and horrible and not feel compelled to tell somebody about it. Those two young girls were everybody's daughter. I refuse to accept evil as a standard bearer in American society. I believe we're one piece of the puzzle away from figuring out who this individual is. To the killer who may be in this room. Do you want to know what we know? Well, one day, you will. You've just listened to a short preview of Scene of the Crime Season 1, Delphi. Be sure to subscribe right now wherever you listen to podcasts. Ieni and Pizzicala's operation was discovered because everyone involved, 
from the Yenian Pizzicala themselves, to the dozen or so teenage girls in their employ, to the rich clientele, were sloppy. The girls talked openly about their exploits. The pimps didn't monitor the size of their ever-expanding client list. And everyone involved left a trail of sordid text messages to one another, and for the most part saved them all. Italian authorities in Rome set up an elaborate sting operation to take down Ieni and Pizzicala, and prosecutors were able to uncover much more detail about the prostitution through seized client logs and text messages on the cell phones taken from the men and their teenaged employees. While Angela and Agnese would become the main witnesses for prosecutors, investigative documents suggested that there were between 12 and 15 underage girls involved in the prostitution ring. The investigation led to the public outing of 20 men who were clients of the young girls, including Mauro Floriani, who was really only notable because he was the husband of Alessandra Mussolini, a prominent member of Silvio Berlusconi's powerful political party and granddaughter of the notorious Benito Mussolini. Court documents outlined how the male clientele, including Mussolini's husband, wrote sleazy text messages to the girls, fully aware that they were underage. Quote, The cell phone records show a careless trail of negotiations between the men and the girls. The going rate, set by Mirko Ieni, was 300 euros per performance, which could be oral, vaginal, or anal sex, and upwards of several thousand euros for a weekend away with unlimited services. The girls paid Ieni a portion of their earnings, which included charges for the use of the rooms in the apartment. Pizzicala, whose alleged role was to find men looking for underage sex, was paid directly from the clients. Prostitution is not illegal in Italy, but prostitution with an underage minor, the same offense Silvio Berlusconi himself was convicted of just one year earlier, is against the law. End quote. When Mirko Ieni was deposed, he told investigators that the girl's young age was, quote, the draw that helped lure customers. There is a real market for young, fresh girls like that. End quote. Barbie Nadeau, for the Daily Beast, writes, quote, According to assistant prosecutor Maria Monteleone, the girls were addicted to the money. Said Monteleone, they made a lot of money, more than 500 to 600 euros a day, which they didn't want to give up. Even after Ieni was arrested, the girls allegedly still kept some of their clients. According to the police reports, the payments could be made in cash, gifts, or even cocaine, which the girls either used or sold back to Ieni. End quote. Agnese's mother played a predatory role in her daughter's involvement with the prostitution. A single mother, struggling to maintain her status as a wealthy resident of Parioli, she encouraged her daughter to keep selling her body for money. Through a wiretap, police recorded a heartbreaking conversation between Agnese and her mother, in which mother pushes daughter to go out and prostitute herself, despite daughter clearly not wanting to go. I dramatized this recording at the top of the episode. Her mother lost her parental rights to Agnese and was sentenced to six years in prison. Angela's mother, however, played a very different role in the baby Squilo case. She called the police when she became concerned and confused about her daughter's sudden surge in income. It was Angela's mother's concern that launched the sting operation that set up the entire investigation. Agnese's mother wasn't the only person to suffer consequences. Mirko Ieni was sentenced to ten years in prison. Nuncio Pizzicala was sentenced to seven years. Many of the clients of the prostitution ring avoided prosecution entirely, but some have faced charges of sex with a minor. The authorities uncovered a list of nearly 50 clients who were receiving performances from Agnese and Angela on a regular basis. Only 11 of these clients received sentences, and the sentences varied in length, but with a maximum 
of up to one year in prison. Some of these cases are still being argued in the Roman courts today. Barbie Nadeau again. Quote, Both Angela and Agnese entered protective custody and received counseling for their ordeal and addiction to the easy money. Mussolini's husband, who works for Italy's state railway service, has denied involvement, despite a string of text messages and police photos of him getting out of a taxi at Via Parioli 190, a club where the girls met their customers. 16-year-old Angela, who had a tattoo on her arm with the Latin phrase, if you want peace, prepare for war, cooperated with police. 14-year-old Agnese was said to be suffering from severe psychological trauma in the aftermath of the baby squilo events. End quote. And that will bring us to the end of our story, folks. I can't tell you why exactly I wanted to do this story for the podcast. I can tell you for sure how I learned about the case, though. I was watching a Netflix Italian drama series called Baby, which I quite enjoyed. It's basically a modern-day Italian version of the OC, but with a gritty drugs and prostitution angle. So pretty much everything I want in a TV show. And while the show has almost nothing to do with the real-life Baby Squilo scandal, the case was the inspiration for the show's premise. So I looked up the case and found some of the details to be pretty interesting. And here we are. I hope the continued lack of murder coverage isn't upsetting too many of you. I've laid out some topics to cover in the coming months. And those of you who Ed and I refer to as murderheads will be pleased to know that I've got plenty of murder coming your way. As we talked about in the Q&A portion of our holiday special, there really hasn't been a conscious decision to talk about dark, dark topics that don't involve murder or serial killers. I just pick and choose crimes that I find interesting to write about. And lately I've been thinking about the concept of true crime as much broader than just murder itself. You know, dogfighting rings and underage prostitution rings are still big crimes. And these stories are true, so I'm still bringing you true crime by its very definition. Whether this is the first episode you've heard, or if you've been a listener for a long time, I'd like to thank you for listening. Dark Dark World is currently a bi-weekly true crime podcast. You can learn more about the show by visiting darkdarkworld.com, where you can find all of our social media accounts. I'd like to encourage you to join our ever-growing closed Facebook group called Dark Dark World Presents the Dark Dark Corner. There you can interact with me and with other listeners of the podcast. We have little contests and discussions over there. It's a lot of fun. So look that up and request to join. I'd also like to encourage you to help the show to grow by telling your friends about it. And if you listen via Apple Podcasts, please consider leaving us a five-star review. If you leave a five-star review and roast me in the comments, I'll read it on the next episode. If you'd like to support the show and gain access to bonus content, please check us out on Patreon. We have a lot of fun content over there, including videos, blooper reels, and outtakes. Plus, bonus episodes about all sorts of topics, not just true crime. Often the bonus episodes just discuss music and entertainment, pop culture stuff. You can gain access to all of that for as little as 2 to $5 per month at patreon.com slash darkdarkworld. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash darkdarkworld. You can also find the link for that and for everything else, including our merch, at the website, darkdarkworld.com. 
Thank you all so much for listening. Ed C. and I will be back in your ears in a couple of weeks when we finally release our blockbuster Charles Manson episode. Until then, see ya!